Nearly 40% of men and women will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lifetimes. For dogs, man's best friend, it's nearly 50%. Having gone through this experience with Sunny, I, I don't take anything for granted. I mean, she was 11. I thought she was going to last till 18, 19, because she was in amazing shape. Hello, everyone. I'm Professor Vanessa Ruiz, and you're watching Catalyst. New research into how curing cancers in dogs might help find cures for cancer in humans. A fundamental step in this new research is happening right here in Arizona. It's the making of vaccines aimed at canine cancers. And the aim is to create a vaccine that you, they would get just like an infectious disease vaccine. They'll get a prime and a boost two weeks later. And if it works, they won't get cancer. Or we will substantially reduce the cancer in those dogs uh, relative to dogs that just get a mock vaccine. So we want to prevent them from getting cancer in the first place. Now, scientists say that dogs and humans are similar enough that if these vaccines work on dogs, they may well work on people too. This YouTube edition of Catalyst is brought to you by Arizona PBS and Arizona State University. Life has problems. Science turns them into questions that can lead to solutions and even innovations. This is Catalyst, shaping the future through science research at Arizona State University. Final run belongs to Sunny, an Australian shepherd with Alicia Calhoun. We were rock and roll stars. I mean, we love to be out there in the heat of things. It's going to cost them because this dog is very efficient. What? Are we going to the vet for? She's pushing everything she's got. The dog, she's still winning everything. 32.66, I don't think they know it yet. How can this possibly be happening? Now they've got the news. 11 hundredths of a second was the margin of victory. During a checkup, Alicia Calhoun learned that Sonny had cancer. Sonny was an award-winning dog. She was 11 years old and Calhoun's best friend. I wouldn't have thought I needed a cancer vaccine then. Sunny's diagnosis, an aggressive blood cancer. And a few weeks later, she died in the back seat of Calhoun's car. I honestly thought, I mean, she was 11. I thought she was gonna last till 18, 19 because she was in amazing shape. Standing right now. Dr. Stephen Johnston works in the Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University. After 10 years of research with a preventative vaccine that shows positive results for mice, new tests are being planned. Results from the new tests may one day take us closer to the testing of similar vaccines on people. The first phase of this is for a vaccine for dogs. And the aim is to create a vaccine that you, they would get just like an infectious disease vaccine. They'll get a prime and a boost two weeks later. And if it works, they won't get cancer. Or we will substantially reduce the cancer in those dogs. And then every six months, they will be monitored to see if they have a cancer or not. And if it's working, we'll see a reduction, a statistically significant reduction in cancer in the vaccine group versus the non-vaccine group. Despite all the aggressive therapies and advanced research, surviving cancer still mostly comes down to beating the odds. Johnston and his team are trying to change that with this new vaccine. So what we discovered is something that everybody else missed. It was sort of a, they were all looking under the wrong lamppost. Everybody now agrees that what we want to put into a vaccine are the mistakes that the tumor makes relative to the normal cell. So the trade-off to become a tumor cell is that you mean you have to relax a lot of your quality control systems. And in that process, you create pieces of proteins that look like, almost like an infection. And so they occur because you make errors in copying your DNA, but they occur very infrequently. And so at the DNA level, tumors are totally personal. Your DNA mutations in your tumor don't look anything like the DNA mutations in somebody else's tumor. But what people forgot was the DNA gets transferred into RNA, it gets transferred into protein, and each step along the way is more error prone. So we figured that out, and we looked at the RNA level, and there we find that they are making those mistakes all the time, and tumors make mistakes in common. 
that everybody else had missed. And that's those mistakes that we pull out, and that's what we're putting into the vaccine. Johnston says he didn't have to argue the impact to anyone. Everyone knew if it worked, it could change cancer research and prevention in profound ways. Unless you can tell me why this is illogical or, or won't work from first principles, then we should try it. Because even if there was a 1% chance that it would work, uh, to invest a few million dollars for a 1% chance of something that dramatic was well worth it. This is Barney. He gets around on three legs now. He had one leg amputated during his fight with bone cancer. He's his regular Barney self. He just can't, you know, run across the yard and he can't jump on the couch. He can't maneuver the way he used to, but he, he's the same great family pet. We're gonna get his weight first. My kids, they're devastated, but they're rallying. Barney was a service animal at Phoenix Children's Hospital, but he hasn't been able to go to work since the amputation. And I feel really bad that he can't go to the hospital right now because he's on chemotherapy, so it's, you can't really have him around those kids. I just don't think that conventional medicine has all the answers all the time, and I just didn't want to tell people that there was nothing we could do if they didn't want to pursue conventional options. He looks happy to see me today. Yeah, he's just in such Nicole a Nicole good... has been looking for new ways to treat Barney other than traditional chemotherapy. She's been working with Dr. Hershey, a veterinary oncologist who combines traditional and alternative therapies. I think we've kind of hit that glass ceiling, so to speak, into what surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy can offer. The same chemotherapy protocols that we were doing when I was a resident are the same chemotherapy protocols that we use today. It's like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. You can put the chairs in whatever direction you want to, but we st the outcome's still the same. Regardless of the outcome, Johnston keeps an open mind about the possibilities these vaccines might create. Worst case is for us, of course, it's unsuccessful, which means we worked for a long time and, and it didn't work. But our view is, is that if we conduct this trial properly, we are very rigorous about how we do it and we do it right, and we fail, people will know that that concept just doesn't work. It probably won't work. And I think that's significant because we think somebody should have tried this a long time ago. To me, it sounds too good to be true, <laughs> to be honest. I think we all want this vaccine to work. Um, I would say I'm, I'm worried that it's not going to work. I find it very hard to believe that we can have one vaccine that's going to prevent multiple cancers, different types of cancer in any dog. But I think it's also very exciting because um, if it does work, it's going to be a huge, huge leap in improvement of care for prevention of cancer and treatment of cancer in, in both dogs, cats, and people. Good, over, right. Since Sunny's death, Alicia is taking all the preventative measures she can for her other dogs. Toby, woohoo! Having gone through this experience with Sunny, I, I don't take anything for granted. When you've been through something like this, you can't help but try to be as preventative and as proactive as you can in their overall health care. It's important that you still live fully. It's important that you, you don't sit down with a label of this is what you've got and this is what it means. It's like, okay, life and joy and that love and that teamwork, it's worth fighting for. We do it and it fails, so is it. And, and we don't waste any more time on it. If we do it and it succeeds, we suspect it would have a huge impact on cancer. What's a very important aspect of this is that we expect this cancer to be vaccine to be very inexpensive. These vaccines are not yet finished, but it is hoped that trials on actual dogs can begin sometime later this year. So we, we think it could be a really big deal. Let's look at the cancer problem from a different direction. Dogs and people both get cancers at fairly high rates. But why do elephants, animals that are far bigger than dogs or people, get cancers far less often? And what if answering that question might just lead to new ways to beat cancer? We have, so we've been working also with the San Diego Zoo. Oh, very and cool. Swazi is a elephant there who is the elephant that was, her genome was the one that was sequenced. Yeah. So Carlo Mainly is talking to a zookeeper in Phoenix. 
from already. So those there. guys are the African elephants. Yes, that's right. Nearly 700 miles away, Joshua Schiffman is experimenting with cells. Though the two men don't share a lab, they do share an interest in elephants and cancer. You want some more cookies? Their research teams are looking directly at one of cancer's big contradictions in hope of trampling the disease in humans. In over 600 elephants, only about 5% of them were dying of cancer. And this is striking because an elephant has about 100 times more cells than us. So this is an old problem in cancer biology called Pito's paradox, which is the observation that every cell of your body has some chance of becoming cancer. So something with 100 times more cells than us, like an elephant, should be getting a ton of cancer. But they don't. Over thousands of years, large animals like elephants have developed cancer-fighting mechanisms that help them beat the odds of getting cancer. While studying data from an elephant genome, Carlo Maley found dozens of copies of a cancer-suppressing gene. We discovered that they have extra copies of a tumor suppressor gene called P53. It's sort of a central hub for detecting damage and stresses to the cell and deciding whether the cell is going to stop to try to fix the damage or just commit cell suicide and get replaced by another one. Humans have two copies, one from your mother and one from your father. Elephants have 40 copies, 20 from their mother and 20 from their father. Dude, you got to get a good aim. Ready? Here we go. Oh! It's, it's like basketball. With the help of Joshua Schiffman at the University of Utah and the nearby Hogel Zoo, researchers were able to make sense of how the extra genes prevent cancer in elephants. All right, girls, here you go. Help us cure cancer. There you go. That's a good. Instead That's of good. two copies of P53, the elephants had evolved 40 copies of P53. Dr. Maley thought that maybe this was the reason why they didn't get cancer. Working together with the Hogel Zoo, and the elephants and the blood from these amazing animals. We were able to take the cells into the laboratory and study how they respond to DNA damage. Before experimenting on the elephant blood sample, Schiffman's lab uses a machine known as a centrifuge to separate white blood cells from the other blood components. Here's what you can see. That's a lot of red cells there. There's your FICOL and this fuzzy white layer, that's all the white blood cells, and that's what we do our experiments on, and this is the plasma. This one is actually from a human, but the only way the elephant would look different is that fuzzy layer was, is even thicker, because they have more white blood cells. What we discovered astounded us. When we looked at the elephant cells compared to people, we found that those elephant cells almost always died when they had any type of mutation. It was as if the elephants had said, it's so important that we don't get cancer. Why even try to stop the cell and repair it when we can just kill it and start over again? There is more to the research than experimenting with blood samples. Data analysis can lead scientists to new experiments. I'm currently working with 65 different mammals and looking through um, 550 genes right now. The stuff that I do can then be later translated into wet lab work. Well, I can kind of do like the background knowledge to see like if this animal has a lot of tumor suppressor gene copies and has really low cancer rates, someone can then do the work on that animal and then figure out maybe why um, they have such low cancer rates and like do DNA damage tests and so forth. So um, I'm kind of like the background to the wet lab work in a way. In the wet lab, we day to day we're taking care of a variety of different kinds of animals, animals that really haven't been studied, but we're looking at how they may or may not be resistant to cancer. Angelo Fortunato will tell you more about that because that's really his project. So in these tanks, uh, we have a species of sponges that we know can live uh, for years. And in order to study cancer development, we need some model organism able to live for a very long time. Otherwise, it's very difficult to study cancer that is a progressive uh, disease. Most of these sponges, they seem to be very resistant to mutagenesis because the experiment that we did until now, they showed that they can recover without developing any cancer-like phenotype after they are exposed to X-ray, for example. In order to prove that these animals are really 
resistant to cancer, uh, we need to try to induce cancer. If we are not uh, able to succeed, it means that they are really resistant to cancer. We're studying cancer across all different kinds of species, and one of the first things we did was we went to the literature and tried to map out across the whole tree of life which branches in the tree of life, which sets of species were getting more or less cancer. And part of that led to the observation that some of these branches have, there's no reports of cancer. And that led to these projects in the lab. The comb jelly is one animal Maley's lab is looking at closely for possible solutions. These are the most ancient form of animals. They're the first animals that ever evolved on Earth, probably on the order of a billion years ago. But the fact that there's no cancer reported in these animals and they're the sort of the examples of the most ancient animals on Earth, we think they probably hold the keys to some of this mystery about how cancer protection evolved. Researchers hope to eventually translate animal cancer fighting mechanisms into cancer therapies for people. All these different large animals hold the answers to this problem we have that's plaguing humans of how do we prevent cancer. And evolution has shown that there's all these different ways of preventing it, but we just don't know. So there's discoveries out there and all the, the animals in this zoo, there's important biology of understanding how to prevent cancer that it's just there waiting there for us to be discovered. So it's really exciting, but then really scary when those animals are endangered and the, the incredible complexity and beauty of that life and also the solutions to many of our human problems are, are, are at risk. A hurricane, an earthquake, a massive fire. When a big disaster hits, we can go to the big news outlets like CNN and the Weather Channel to get the big picture of what's going on. But when people very close to you are inside a disaster, it is their lives, their exact situation you most want to know about, the little picture. And now science is looking at how to make our little screens, things for example like phone apps and social media sites, give us better answers about who is caught up in a disaster and how to help them. When Hurricane Florence pounded the coastal Carolinas, pictures of the damage reminded many Americans of Hurricane Maria, which struck Puerto Rico a year before. And according to George Washington University, left almost 3,000 people dead. In disasters like this, the water and the emotions run deep, and there's an unlikely hero helping to keep people safe. I don't know how I would have deal with the anxiety and frustration and sadness if it wasn't by social media. People have started realizing that there's a lot of potential in using social media data for disaster relief. <laughs> I think that people really understood the power of social media in terms of how to use it to mobilize. How do you, how you can use it to even to prevent um, for all the other disasters to happen. The people of Puerto Rico, including Manuel's parents, Jesus and Doris, were dealing with high winds and high stakes. The agua de la piscina, see the water pool, we use it for shower, washing machine, water, and all that stuff. Exactly two weeks after Hurricane Irma hit Puerto Rico, Hurricane Maria made landfall. Social media and Facebook especially would play a big role in bringing families back together. Maria is the first hurricane that we experienced through social media. People turn to social media for uh, getting the news on a disaster or reporting it on their own status after a disaster happens, even before going to uh, traditional news sources. Tahora Nazar studies social media data mining and computer science at ASU. She uses tweets and Facebook posts from people like Manuel during disasters. We were trying to get some information about what was going on in the island. Another friend of mine contacted me, she told me, let's create a group. The idea of the group initially was just to get information about the status of situation and to create some sort of central space on which people could rely and provide information and be verified at the same time. By the next day, it becomes like a massive source of information for most of the people because no one had like connection with their families and friends. They were sharing the Facebook Live on that specific Facebook group. 
We even have a situation in which there was a Facebook Live of people who actually found connection in the island and they were in the roof because there was a flooding happening in the community. So these people were sharing their Facebook Live in the roof while the hurricane and the authorities were informed and they were actually helped. First responders rescuing people after the hurricane were assisted by social media data miners who helped decide which areas of the island needed the most help. Here's how data mining works. We have a system named Tweet Tracker that collects data uh, all the time from Twitter. Tweet Tracker is a tool built by ASU's Data Mining and Machine Learning Lab, and it is very helpful during disasters. Whenever a disaster happens, we start a data collection job which collects the tweets related to that disaster. We have models that detect the tweets in which people ask for help or resources. People use social media to get the news about rainfall totals, storm surges, and other updates on Hurricane Florence. It was even trending on Twitter, but on a platform where over 350,000 tweets are sent per minute, how do you figure out which ones are cries for help? We usually collect the tweets using special keywords. The next step is analyzing that data. We usually start with a very simple analysis. For example, if you want to find a specific tweets, for example, the ones people are asking for resources or when people are trapped somewhere and they are requesting for help, we can have first responders looking at the tweets one by one and selecting the ones which are relevant. But we want a model that automatically does that, and that's when the machine learning comes in, to automatically do what uh, first responders has to spend a lot of time to do that. The lines of social media rise as power lines fall during hurricanes. Manuel learned of his family's safety through Facebook before he even spoke to them on the phone. I had the first contact with my family actually through a friend that I was able to contact him through social media. He told me, I'm going to the West Coast and I'm going to stop by your family. I'm going to take a picture of them and record a video for you. Estoy super contenta y emocionada de verlo en ese video. No saben la alegría tan grande que hemos recibido. Es tan hermoso y bello como siempre. Los amo con todo mi corazón y le he hecho mil bendiciones. Yo sé que pronto nos vamos a ver. I was able to talk to my family two weeks after the hurricane for the first time. No communication at all. No communication. That's all. Okay. Nada, nada, nada. They found an old telephone, they connected to the landline, and it actually worked. Uh, so we were able to talk to them. I mean, hearing them after such a long time, it was, it was amazing. For this family and for many others, social media connected them in times of need. Organizations like Humanity Road are focused on helping victims and bringing supplies after disasters. And they also use the numbers people like Tahora Nazar are crunching. It's interesting to see that the research that we do has an impact on the real world, especially when we uh, come in touch with people in Humanity Road or other NGOs and see what, even the small uh, pieces of information that we provide for them, provides information that is missing and it can help with the disaster relief process. We created community, we were channeling help and sometimes I question myself how I would have done it without this. I'm Professor Vanessa Ruiz, and thank you for watching Catalyst, our show about science. And because science always has new questions to answer, we'll be back soon with more stories. Catalyst is supported by Knowledge Enterprise Development at Arizona State University. Advancing entrepreneurship, innovation, discovery, and knowledge for the public good.
Subscribe to this channel to see more episodes of Catalyst on YouTube.